Hi everyone, welcome to Socorro's webinar series, Coastal Observing in Your Community. My name is Abby Wakely, Socorro's Communications Director, and I will be facilitating and moderating the webinar. Socorro is hosting this webinar series to discuss, highlight, and raise awareness about coastal ocean observing activities in the Southeast U.S. and beyond. Socorro is the Regional Coastal Ocean Observing System for North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. We are one of 11 that make up the NOAA-led U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System, also known as U.S. IUS. Our mission is to sustain and promote observations that help keep you safe. This is a quick snapshot of the technology we support to accomplish our mission. I want to spend a minute and do a few updates on Socorro activities. We will be hosting an in-person meeting December 2nd through 3rd in St. Petersburg, Florida. Topics will include harmful algal blooms, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and new Socorro projects. Please save the date. And Socorro is currently soliciting proposals to sponsor up to six candidates from the U.S. Southeast and Caribbean regions to attend three drone education courses offered by the Nicholas School of Environment at Duke University. Proposals are due June 30th, and I will email out the link to everybody who has been registered for the webinar. All right, enough talk of Socorro. Let's get to the reason you are all here at the webinar. During the webinar, we highly encourage you to ask questions for the presenters or technical questions for me by clicking this icon here and typing in your question. I will post them to the presenters after their presentation. And as a reminder, we are recording this webinar today and we'll be posting the recording on the Socorro website and also emailing it directly to you. We are very excited to welcome two speakers. Today, we have Greg Dusick from NOAA National Ocean Service and Alex Pang from the University of California, Santa Cruz. They will be presenting applying technology to improve our ability to forecast, observe, and detect rip currents. Greg is a physical oceanographer and the chief scientist for the NOAA National Ocean Service Center for Operational Oceanographic products and services. He also serves as the National Ocean Service lead for artificial intelligence and as the chair of the NOAA Artificial Intelligence Executive Committee. Greg has studied rip currents and beach, beach hazards for over 15 years and his research broadly focuses on coastal oceanographic product development through the intersection of data science with coastal science. Alex Pang is a professor of computer science and engineering at the University of California, Santa Cruz. His research interests are primarily in scientific visualization with a focus on uncertainty and flow visualization. More recently, his research interests are in applying and developing technology for the benefit of society with applications such as rip current detection, search and rescue aids, physics inspired machine learning based wildfire fire modeling and tools for first responders of mass shootings. All right, so Greg is going to kick us off first and then Alex will be presenting. So Greg, I'm going to stop presenting my screen and pass you over controls. If you can just give me one second. All right, so you should be getting the controls to be presenter. Okay, let me see. All right, okay. looks like we have the right right screen. We should be good. You can see it yep, okay? and I can hear you. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Abby, for that introduction. Um, and uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, as Abby mentioned, Alex and I are going to be talking about uh, some recent work we've been doing around rip currents, and in particular, talking about uh, applying technology to improve our ability to forecast, observe, and detect rip currents. I'm going to start with some background information about rips, what they are, why we care about this, uh, then get into uh, our new NOAA rip current model that was just released and talk a little bit about how we've validated that model. And then I'm going to pass to Alex and he's going to talk a lot more about uh, rip current detection using imagery and the work that his team has done there. Um, so, First, I wanted to start with uh, a story um, to kind of talk about the benefits of being informed about rip currents and the hazard. And so this was back in May in North Carolina near, near Wilmington, where an off-duty Coast Guard member, uh, Jennifer Williamson, was at the beach with her family and friends, and she noticed three men in the water struggling, caught in a rip current. Uh, and Jennifer 
decided to go in and try to rescue them. Now, that's something we typically tell people not to do because what we often see is someone will react to the situation, go in to attempt to rescue someone, and then end up being the one who drowns uh, because they end up you know, struggling, panicking, not being able to, to rescue the folks and get out. Um, now, in this case, it was a happy ending because Jennifer had training to make uh, rescues through her time with the Coast Guard. Um, and then she also knew what to do. So instead of just rushing into the water, she went, grabbed a boogie board, something, you know, flotation device, went in with that and was able to successfully rescue the three men and make it out unharmed. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a positive story showing the benefit of, of having an understanding of the hazard and having proper training and, 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 you know, the ability to respond to that hazardous situation in, in the correct way. And that's something that NOAA has tried to do through both our messaging uh, and communication about rip currents, uh, but then also by providing information through our forecast models to raise awareness of potential hazardous days and the potential hazard. And, and the reason we do that, of course, is because, as you all probably know, uh, rip currents are the number one public safety risk at the beach, both in the U.S. and worldwide. And if you look at the number of recorded rip current drownings in the U.S. every year, you can see we have about 60 or 70 a year. And that's just recorded drownings because in many cases we don't know the cause of drowning or the drowning doesn't get reported at all. And, and we think that the number of rip-related drownings in the U.S. is more closer to about 100 per year. And this, this year, right now, uh, through last week, we had 36 rip current drownings already in the U.S., which is the most we've seen by June 18th over the past five years. Um, and to put that number in context, last year on June 18th, we had only 17 rip current drownings. And so, you know, this continues to be a huge problem, even though we've done some social science work, which suggests that people's kind of rip current awareness is higher than it used to be and that people know generally what to do if caught in a rip. Uh, but we're still seeing drownings. And, and so what NOAA is trying to do and, and working closely with many of our partners like the United States Life Saving Association uh, and UC Santa Cruz, our academic partners, Socorro and others, you know, how can we work on improving preparedness and prevention? Because clearly it's not enough just to tell people what they need to do once they're in that life-threatening situation. You know, we really want to make sure that hopefully people avoid it altogether or are prepared for it uh, before it occurs. And so, you know, beyond our just broader messaging, that's the role, one role that rip current forecasting and rip current modeling can, can help support. So before I get into the model, uh, just a quick overview of what is a rip current. And so here's, I apologize for the stuttering video, but, but you should get the picture. Um, this is a rip current where we took imagery actually in North Carolina, uh, up at Kill Devil Hills on the Outer Banks. And you can see the rip current in the center of the video there where there's foam sediment being pulled offshore, which is one way to identify a rip. And you can also kind of see there's kind of a flat spot in the line of breaking waves there, uh, or a gap in the line of breaking waves. And that's another way you can identify a rip. In terms of rip current characteristics, typically range anywhere from about 100 to 400 meters offshore, um, can be about 15 to 100 meters wide. And they can last anywhere from you know, minutes to months. And that kind of depends on the forcing mechanism, what's causing that particular rip. And then in terms of speeds, you know, they can reach an excess of about two meters per second, which is about five miles per hour, which I know to many people sounds slow. Uh, but if you consider that the world record in the men's 100 meter butterfly, the average speed is about five miles per hour. So you know, unless or even if you are an Olympic swimmer, that can, can cause you some problems. In terms of why rip currents occur, and this particular rip, you know, we put some dye in it. You've probably seen this video or this image before. Uh, we use it in a lot of our, our messaging. Uh, but what you can see is that on either side of the dye, which shows where the rip is, there's, there's increased waves breaking. And those waves are breaking there because the water is shallower, because there's a sandbar. Uh, whereas where you have the, the rip current, there's a channel or deeper water. And so you kind of have shallow, deep, shallow in terms of, of the water characteristics, and that's important because where you have waves breaking at the beach, you have something called setup, shoreward of those breaking waves. And setup is a relative increase in water level caused by the height or the, the action of breaking waves. And so where you have increased waves breaking, you have increased setup or an increase in water level. Where you have uh, deeper water and less waves breaking, you have lower setup or a lower water level and water wants to flow downhill. 
So it flows from the regions of high setup to low setup and then offshore through the rip channel. Um, now this particular rip is caused by the shape of the bottom. You can have rips uh, from other types of features, uh, in particular structures, right? You often have rips near jetties, piers, groins, uh, any sort of hard structure along the coastline. This is a location near the Great Lakes, uh, Holland Beach, where we have a webcam actually. We're working on using that to detect rip currents here. But you can see kind of where I have the arrow where there's a little bit of a flat spot in the waves and that's showing the location of, of the rip. Um, and structures can both cause variations in breaking waves similar to what we saw with the bathymetry or, or the, the, uh, the sandbar. They can also deflect in the longshore current, pushing it offshore and creating a rip. And then of course you can also have rips just from waves themselves. So waves coming from two different angles from the north and south and intersecting near shore and causing variations in breaking wave heights. And those are transient or dynamic uh, rips and they can, they can kind of come and go in the matter of seconds to minutes. Um, and so harder to, to, to detect and to observe. So in terms of rip current forecasting, this was a question that I started looking at back in 2006, 2007, when I was a grad student at UNC Chapel Hill, and, and the question was, can we accurately forecast rip currents? And, and you know, there'd been a lot of work by that time in the scientific community, better understanding rips, but we hadn't really applied it, uh, applied that science to try to really uh, improve our ability to model them. And so we collected information about the shape of the near shore and the bottom using GPS. We deployed uh, ADCPs, acoustic Doppler current profilers to measure the waves near shore and then work closely with lifeguards who provided us observations of rip currents because rip currents are really hard to observe in situ, right? It's hard to deploy instruments in the surf zone. Um, and at this point, when we started this work, really the only way we could do this and have enough data of rips was to work with lifeguards and, and utilize their observations to create our model. So uh, what ended up coming out of this work was we developed a rip current model um, that's a, a statistical model or a machine learning model um, where we looked at a number of different factors and found out which ones led to the occurrence of hazardous, of hazardous rips. And so in this case, it's, it was really boiled down to four things, significant wave height, wave direction, water level, which mostly is the tide, um, and, then, and then the shape of the bottom. And we captured that through what we call a post-wave event variable, which really just looks at what happened over the last few days in terms of wave heights and says, okay, if we have a storm, we're more likely to see favorable rip current bathymetry for a few days after that. So we used those and then we figured out the, the hazardous rip current likelihood from zero to one or zero to 100% given those inputs. And during our initial testing, we compared that to, you know, kind of the more manual index approach, a spreadsheet approach that was done at many weather service forecast offices up till now. Um, and we found a 67% improvement at least uh, compared to that approach. So it worked really well. For North Carolina. Um, we obviously had to then start thinking about transitioning it to work across the U.S. and that's the work that we've been doing over the past really almost past decade now. Um, and we just rolled this out uh, just a few months ago in February of this year uh, where the root current forecast model is now running as a component of the nearshore wave prediction system which is a, a combination of, of wave and water level models, computer models run by the National Weather Service across the coastal US. And so you can see the coverage there of the continental US. Um, and if you zoom into a, a location, you can see how we output the information from the RIP model, uh, the different colors representing uh, the, you know, roughly kind of what the RIP current likelihood is, a yellow being at least a 25% likelihood, a red being a 50% likelihood. And then if you click on one of these buttons, you can see the time series or one of the locations, you can see the time series of RIP currents. And so, the rip current model is output every kilometer or so along shore, every hour going six days into the future. And you can see on the top plot there showing you the rip current probability given wave height, period, direction, water level, those, those wave characteristics in the plots below. And so this is a huge step up in what we're able to provide because now we're able to provide probabilistic information and we're able to provide that you know, at a much higher resolution in space and time and much further into the future, which really opens up a whole range of possibilities in terms of getting this information to the public, but then also to, to beach safety personnel, uh, ocean safety personnel, to be able to have you know, a heads up about what might be coming in the days to head. 
the model has been implemented now into operation that these uh, weather forecast offices, so covering most of the East Coast, most of the Gulf Coast, um, uh, Southern California around San Diego, and then Guam, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. And then over the next uh, couple, over the next this year and next year, really, we're going to be working on filling out the rest of the coastline. Uh, we have it in 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 uh, kind of testing right now at the rest of the Gulf offices and in the West Coast. Um, and then in the future, over the next couple of years, trying to figure out how to do this in the Great Lakes, which is a is a special challenge because in the lakes, structural currents are much more important um, and and those are gonna be much more harder to model because you're gonna to have to have information at specific structures. Um, and that's something we're gonna to have to work on. Uh, but we'll be, we're already starting to work with the, weathers, the weather forecast offices in the lakes and, and working on collecting observations. And of course, there's less lifeguard observations in the Great Lakes as well. So that makes uh, testing and validating and, and, and training a model there difficult. So lastly, I wanted to just touch on how do we do this? So how is the rip, how do we validate our rip current model and retrain it uh, in different locations? And so I'm gonna briefly touch on lifeguard observations, which I mentioned, some work we did a few years ago with partners on doing some in situ comparison with actual current observations in the surf zone. And then just touch on briefly the webcam piece and then Alex will expand upon that a little bit further. So in terms of, of lifeguard observations, so as I mentioned, when we first created the model, this is the approach we used. We worked with the lifeguards in Kill Devil Hills and they collected observations for us twice a day and rated them, you know, zero, one, two, three in terms of what they observed in rip current strength. Um, and so we followed a similar approach now with other lifeguard groups and supported uh, by the USLA on this um, in terms of providing kind of regular input in terms of what they are observing for hazardous rip currents. And so this is just an example of the report. This was developed by the Meteorological Development Lab uh, of, of National Weather Service. And so they've worked closely with the different lifeguard groups and with the, the weather forecast offices really who are kind of the, the boots on the ground for us and coordinate with a lot of the different life-saving agencies to start to collect this information throughout the coastal US so we can validate our model and, and, then, and then recalibrate it or retrain it for different regions. To just give you an example of how this works, um, these are two locations. Um, this is work done by my colleague at MDL, uh, Young Sun, Sun Im, um, and, and she's done a lot of great work in terms of validating this at all these different locations. And so you can see these are examples of, of plots showing a comparison between the forecast, which is on the x-axis, and the observations on the y-axis. And the red line there is a one-to-one -one line. So what you're looking for is, you know, when we issue a forecast of a certain likelihood, on average, what do we see from those rip current observations from the lifeguards? And ideally, you'd like to be about on that one-to-one -one line. And you can see in each of these cases, the left one is from Maryland to Northern North Carolina, uh, which is the Wakefield WFO, and then, and then Miami there on the right. And in both cases, it's not bad. We're under forecasting a little bit, meaning we're not forecasting rips quite as much as we should. Um, but this is without retraining. This is just using the default uh, uh, machine learning equation that we developed in North Carolina and Kill Double Hills. And it's even on that level, it's showing an improvement. So we saw for both a 22% improvement over climatology um, at predicting rips. And in Miami, we compared it to the index approach that I mentioned before, and we found a 30% improvement, at least in terms of uh, improving over the index approach. These improvements are even greater if this model is retrained. And what we found is that when we retrain at specific locations, uh, we see a skillful model at all those locations when it's retrained, and in many cases, uh, improvement, pretty dramatic improvements over, over climatology. So, so we're pretty confident in how this model works um, and how we're able to implement it across the US. In terms of, of in situ observations, this is work that was done actually a number of years ago now, about four years ago, uh, working with some partners, Melissa Moulton included, who's at UW, um, and and some others, uh, and and used work data that they collected at the field research facility on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, where they deployed instruments in the surf zone, and you can see the yellow arrows there showing where they had current meters. We were able to use those observations to then compare that to the model output and see how does it compare to actual speeds of rip currents. Um, and in this, we had two different data sets. One was from 
um, bathymetry that was artificially generated. They drove that landing craft through sandbars to create channels, which is a pretty cool thing and, and really helps with instrumentation because you know where the rip's gonna be. And then we had a data set where the bathymetry was actually naturally occurring. And then we compared that to our model. And I'll just show this quickly. Um, here's a time series here on the top is showing you on the red, the observed rip current speed. On the right in, in blue is the, the, the model likelihood from zero to one. Um, then wave height, wave direction, and water level uh, on the three plots below. And I just wanna draw your attention to those three blue arrows where you can see that when we observed elevated rip current speed, we, we also predicted a rather high likelihood of rip currents occurring. And it's not a one-to-one, -one, right? We're just, the likelihood is really just saying, are there hazardous rips? It doesn't really say anything about speed, but clearly what we see is that when there are elevated speeds, when rips were pulling, we are predicting a higher likelihood and that those tidal oscillations are really well captured um, and points to the important of, importance of the tide. The other thing we found here, uh, besides just saying, hey, the model actually agrees really good with in situ observations, was through a comparison, we found that rip currents as slow as about 0.2 meters per second could be hazardous, which was a surprise to us because I don't think, at least I didn't expect that, you know, that's not water moving that fast. I didn't really expect that rips that slow could potentially be hazardous, but I think it points to the fact that if you have rip currents, if they have the potential to pull people offshore, you know, they could be a potential safety risk. And so then lastly, I'm gonna introduce our, our WebCoos project, which is webcams for coastal observations and operational support. Uh, this is work led by Socora, funded through uh, IUS through the NOAA OTT program uh, just this past September. And it's a partnership which includes a whole bunch of folks, including University of South Carolina, Santa Cruz, Wilmington, Axiom, and NOAA. Um, and, and the goals here, and this was building on some prototype work we did, uh, which was funded by the Ocean Service as well. Uh, the goals here is to basically start working with webcam operators and end users and, and work on providing observational data using this low cost technology, because webcams aren't that expensive. They're ubiquitous. They're basically everywhere, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, but the data is not easy to access, right? You'd have to go to every individual person running one of those webcams to be able to utilize it. And so what we want to do is operationalize a national webcam data management network. So we're pulling in all these different sources. We don't have to run or maintain all these webcams. But if there's a data stream, we can pull it in and then we can use that information for a whole host of things. Um, and we can provide it to people to use for whatever their application may be. And so we're working on automating the processing of this imagery and then also developing situational monitoring and reporting tools for information on beach activities and hazards. So working with coastal communities, working with other users to make sure, you know, we're not just dumping the imagery on them, but getting them downstream products that, that they need to make intelligent decisions um, at the beach. And so just some examples here, you can see on the right, those are kind of showing kind of standard uh, output from webcams in terms of time average imagery, time variance imagery, time stacks, which shows along a beach transect, how waves are approaching uh, the, uh, up the up the beach and to the dune line potentially to look at erosion and overwash. Um, and so we're working on developing this network and then for rip currents, utilizing this imagery to detect rip currents and then using that data to help improve our forecast model even further. And so I'm gonna stop here and just summarize a couple things uh, one, that our forecast model has demonstrated skill uh, everywhere that we've tested it and has been implemented into no operations, which I think is a, is a pretty important first step. And now we're working towards complete national coverage and then of course improving the model even further. And then I'm gonna leave Alex to discuss the next piece in terms of you know, how we can continue to do better is advancing our ability to detect rip currents um, which can help both improve our model, as I mentioned, and potentially also better inform the public uh, about the hazard and, and what to look for. Uh, so I will finish here with just acknowledgements and then I'll pass to Alex. Um, and, and, and just, you can see here a huge uh, number of people that have been involved with this and it's probably even bigger than this list. Um, and so credit to all these folks who have been you know, really integral in pulling this all together. All right, Alex. Thank you, Greg. Thank you so much. Um, Alex, I'm going to quickly promote you to presenter so you can share your screen. Okay.
Can right. people see my screen now? Yep, it's perfect. Go right ahead. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and thanks, Greg. Uh, nice, nice uh, segue here. So my presentation will focus on the detection of the RIP uh, currents, and I'll primarily be talking about two different approaches that we have worked on. Um, the first one is going to be flow-based um, technique. And the student who was primarily responsible for this work is Issei Mori. Uh, he just graduated and will be uh, actually going on to grad school. Uh, so for this approach, the main method is basically a video source. Uh, and uh, the other requirement is that the video must be fixed. So a situation where this would be applicable would be uh, the web cruise network that Greg just mentioned. Uh, in terms of output capabilities, potentially we could do uh, continuous real-time detection, monitoring, and uh, visualization of rip currents uh, where they are present. Uh, and in terms of methodology for this approach, the main thing is that we need to first obtain an optical flow map from the video, and then we apply uh, several visualization, uh, flow visualization techniques to detect and highlight the rip currents uh, where they're present. So a uh, little bit uh, background on the optical flow map. Um, it's a pretty standard technique, and the two uh, the package that we're using is uh, OpenCV, uh, Open Computer Visualization Package, and um, two of the optical flow methods that are provided there is a Farnback method, uh, which produces a dense per pixel based optical flow uh, map, and the other method is Lucas Canada method which allows you to track um, uh, points that you specify on the, on the video and it would track the progression or, or the trajectory of those selected points. So in the two images below, we can see on the left, uh, the farm back method, which is uh, showing uh, two cars moving in the same direction and a little bit uh, in the background, uh, a bluish color car going in, in the other direction. Uh, and on the bottom right, we see a uh, trajectory of the points that are being tracked. Um, so using the optical flow map, we apply, um, we, we investigate a couple of uh, flow visualization methods to look at uh, potentially um, rip currents. So what we're going to see next is a uh, overview of a, a rip current and on the right, it's the same red current, but this time we use uh, basically uh, pseudo coloring where we map color to direction of the flow uh, that's indicated on this upper right corner. And then the, uh, the brightness or the darkness uh, to speed. So the darker color, it would indicate lower speed, the brighter color indicates uh, a higher speed. So, uh, let me go ahead and try to play this more or less simultaneously. Uh, bottom left is the original uh, video clip. Bottom right is the uh, color map. And we could see using the color mapping here, the direction of the flow, as well as um, um, uh, in different directions, as well as the color indicating the different speeds. Uh, another uh, thing that we played with is the basic uh, arrow glyphs, uh, arrows to indicate directions. Uh, in this case, we bend the arrows into six different directions. And the main direction that is opposite the main flow is uh, assumed to be that of the rip current. And then the two neighboring bends are also displayed as yellow arrows to indicate possibly uh, feeder currents. So over here, we'll see um, region of uh, strong outward flow as well as regions where they have uh, supporting uh, flow from the sides. Uh, the next couple of uh, techniques uh, are also flow based, but this time we use numerical integration to track um, uh, how the flow evolves. So we're going to see three simultaneous videos. Let me um, just kind of describe a quick preview here. So the top left is going to be the original clip. 
the the uh, middle clip is going to be um, simulation where somebody would drop a fluorescent dye, for example. This would be a, a, a numerical uh, analogy of that. And uh, on the bottom right would be a, something similar to this, except it's going to be spread across the beach. Um, the other thing to note is that um, over here, uh, somebody introduced this die, um, it would then get carried by the current either forward, backward, or sideways. And over time, it would dissipate. So what we do is we continuously introduce new die over time. And as the die age and move away, the transparency fades off. And we do the same thing over here as well. So uh, let's see what happens. So in the middle frame, it, it tries to simulate what uh, something similar to what Greg showed earlier where somebody dropped off a green dye. And this would make sense if you are trying to confirm the existence of a rip current at that location. Uh, we'll see that the dye is pretty much constrained within this region here. Uh, but in terms of detection, we usually we don't know where the dye is. So we would then uh, essentially put the dye everywhere along the beach and we'll see in this case, where it might concentrate and here where it simply just fades off. Uh, the next technique is very similar to what we just saw, except instead of uh, depicting uh, how those points are uh, moving as, as a function of the uh, flow field, uh, we simply uh, draw them as lines. So the analogy here would be you have a chain of buoys and each of the buoys are connected by infinitely stretchable line segments. So here's how this would look like on the video clip that um, uh, we saw from Greg earlier. So the gray line is where the original uh, release point is, and then the blue line is the time varying position of that timeline. So what this uh, visualization shows is that there's a region where it protrudes out from the original position and that's indicative of where a rip current might be and then the rest of the line would be pushed towards the beach because the predominant flow is actually from the incoming wave direction. So we applied uh, this different techniques uh, to uh, uh, sample video clips that we have collected from different um, from the web pretty much and we can see that at least for cases where the rip current signals is very is quite obvious and quite strong uh, these methods work fairly well uh, here we can see uh, the rip current being highlighted with this red and a little bit of the yellow arrows uh, here we have uh, the colored uh, region uh, we call this filtered because we've pretty much filtered out the direction of the main flow, which is the incoming wave direction. So we filter those out because those are uh, a little bit distracting and what we want to do is highlight where the rip current is. Uh, same thing is true with the aeroglyphs. With the timelines, we simply, uh, in this case, we simply put the gray line along uh, in the middle of the surf zone and uh, we observe where uh, there's a protrusion from the original uh, uh, release points. Uh, and we do the same thing for this other uh, video clip. And again, we see consistent uh, identification of where the rip current might be. This one is a little bit off, uh, but it's also consistent with this other color. So visually, uh, if we look at this visually, it might one might think that the main rip is here, but from the flow information, uh, the, the strongest rip is actually a little bit uh, towards the right. <clears throat> uh, so that was the easy case. Uh, here's a more difficult case where we have a weak, uh, a pretty weak uh, rip current, but at, at least for this uh, location, this is actually a structural rip current uh, on the left side that's kind of going out. So we have two different methods that we tried. Uh, both are integration based. Uh, we've seen this one timeline, and what we did was we, we added another uh, timeline here, 
Uh, so we have two sets of virtual um, buoy chains. And here we have like a shotgun approach where each point is basically a floating buoy, um, virtual, virtual buoy. So let's see how this two compares. So um, let me just say a little bit about the one on bottom right first, since it's a little bit more obvious at this point. So the green line here indicates that the flow is starting to go seaward. And then this blue curve here indicates that um, there's actually on near shore, there's a fairly um, somewhat strong uh, longshore current. And again, the main uh, fair, the structural rip is going out in this direction here on the left. And on this other part here, we start to see um, the dots here uh, have uh, the group has moved to the uh, towards the left and a little bit out as well. Okay, uh, quick summary on the flow-based approach. Uh, the visual results are fairly intuitive and can potentially show where the rip currents are located. Um, so this would be a nice complement to uh, coastal beach warning signage or uh, warnings uh, posted uh, based on the rip forecast models. Uh, this would be useful for uh, beachgoers to avoid where the rip currents might be. Um, the methods can run in real time with GPU acceleration. And again, it's suitable for uh, video sources with, that are from fixed platforms, such as the webcams. Uh, the downsides or the negatives are that the methods are not fully automated. Uh, it requires user input, such as where the timeline should be located. For site-specific locations, uh, that would be a fairly easy fix. Uh, for general um, usage, such as like a mobile platform, uh, we would still need to work on that. Uh, so those are the current limitations. Next, I'm going to switch gears and talk about the other approach, which is uh, based on machine learning uh, detection. And the student who is primarily responsible for this work is Aquila De Silva, who just uh, advanced to uh, uh, in, in, his, in the PhD program. Um, so the input requirements for this uh, approach can either be uh, video clips or can be individual frames or snapshots. Uh, the output capabilities is real-time detection at the frame level. Uh, so you don't need the entire video. You could uh, do classification based on individual snapshots. And the output also indicates uh, where the rip current might be by placing a box around that location. The methodology, um, since it requires a machine learning model, we would require uh, labeled training data to train the model. Uh, the model that we use is uh, something called Faster RCNN, and it's the most uh, highly cited and used uh, machine le deep uh, learning machine learning model. Uh, what we did was we added temporal smoothing as well, which uh, you'll see later on uh, how that would come in handy. <clears throat> prior work, uh, there's two uh, prior work on. Uh, applying machine learning techniques to detect rip currents, and those are these two here. Both of them are uh, using, are, do use machine learning approach, uh, just like the one we're, I'm about to present. Uh, the main difference is that both of these methods, uh, their input images are based on Timex, which are time exposure uh, of video clips that are converted into single images. Uh, as such, uh, the type of rip currents that they can detect are primarily uh, bathymetry controlled rips, uh, such as the one that Greg mentioned, where you have a high setup uh, in between a low setup um, location. <clears throat> the training data that we used were collected from essentially um, Google search and, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and labeled manually. The type of rips that we're primarily focused with uh, for this initial study is also bathymetry controlled rips, uh, but it can be trained with other type of rip currents as well. So for the purposes of today, we're focusing on bathymetry controlled rips. Uh, so the training labels include 
placing boxes around uh, where the rip locations are. It includes both uh, images with rips as well as without rips. And then the training data set was then um, augmented uh, with um, the reflections, rotations, and so on to essentially triple the size of the training data. In terms of machine learning models, the size of the training data set is actually fairly small. But even with this fairly small data set, uh, we were able to achieve uh, quite impressive um, accuracy results. <clears throat> OK, so those are training data. In terms of test data, we also uh, added uh, data. That, so typically, people would, would save some of the training, some of the data set for training and some of the data set for testing. Here, we added test data that were not in the training data set, uh, so video clips that we've, again, collected over uh, the web. Uh, additional information about where uh, some of this test data could be obtained are described in this paper. Uh, details about the presentation or about the algorithms are also available in this paper. Uh, so again, the model that we're using is something called Foster RCNN. Uh, the network basically takes an input uh, image uh, frame from a video, perhaps, uh, runs it through a deep convolution uh, network, obtains a feature map. Based on the feature map, it has these two branch. branch. Uh, first branch is a classification that says whether there's a rip current or not. And then if there's a rip current, where it might be. So these are the bound, this produces the bounding box. Uh, what's um, What's interesting about this is that there's this region proposal network where, uh, given an image, uh, the, the architecture produces a bunch of proposed regions of where, the, where a rip current might be. And in the process of running through this architecture, this, 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 this uh, ML model, um, we, uh, or, or it classifies how likely a proposed region is a rip or not. Uh, again, based on the earlier training of the model. Okay, uh, so when we, after training that model, we tested it on individual frames. Uh, these were uh, single snapshots from the, from the data that we collected. And so uh, in, in frames where we have two boxes, the blue boxes indicate the ground truth or basically uh, the, the box label that was uh, placed uh, as part of the training data. The red boxes are the output from the trained model, which says, I think there's a rip in this region. So as you can see, the, the, the location and the size of the boxes are fairly, uh, are, are pretty good match with the ground truth. And places where uh, there is no rip, um, the, there's the true, false, uh, 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 the model does pretty well as well. Okay, uh, so that was on a frame level. We tried that on video clips, and what we found was that there's quite a bit of, um, uh, there's true, po true positives and as well as false um, negatives. So what we did then was we tried to um, uh, apply some kind of temporal, temporal smoothing by doing this frame accumulation. So basically what we do is we have a window of n frames where we, um, apply the model to classify whether there's a rip or not. And some of them do identify the rips and some frames may, might say there's no rip. Uh, what we do is we collect all of those in a, again, moving time window. And uh, we, we aggregate uh, all those information to try to smooth out the um, uh, false negatives. Okay, so this illustrates on the left, uh, straightforward faster RCNN, and on the right with uh, temporal smoothing. <coughs> okay, so as you can see on the left, uh, the, the identification box is quite jittery, and in some frames, uh, there are no boxes as well. And on the right with temporal smoothing, uh, it's um, a bit more uh, smoother. Okay. 
All right, so quick summary of the machine learning based approach is that it runs on real time on desktop. Uh, uh, that's the current uh, state. Uh, it works on images and on videos. The average accuracy is uh, based on the collection of um, video clips, uh, test, test data that we have uh, run it on is about 98.4%. Uh, on the downside, uh, the training data set that we currently uh, that we use to train the current model is based on bathymetry controlled RIPs. Uh, we are in the process of collecting additional training data sets for other types of RIP currents, primarily those with sediment plumes and foamy water. Um, and uh, the other downside is, as you can see, uh, the training data set are primarily, primarily images. So the detection is based on the appearance of the RIPs. Uh, and not necessarily on behavior. So uh, part of our future work is actually trying to incorporate the behavior of the rip current as part of the, in, in the detection process to hopefully create uh, detect um, uh, rips that are perhaps weaker um, as well. Uh, the other thing that we wanna do uh, as part of our future effort is uh, have a hybrid approach where we combine both the flow-based or physics-based approach together with a machine learning-based approach. Uh, we're also working on, another student is working on, on, on creating uh, mobile versions of uh, our work, uh, primarily for citizen science uh, use. Uh, this will be useful for collecting additional data for validation as well as for beach safety uses. Associated with a citizen science project is that uh, the data collected by citizen science may not be as um, as um, high quality, perhaps as uh, an observation made by a lifeguard or somebody who is expert in rip current detection. So one of the research questions in terms of machine learning is how do you incorporate or how do you curate uh, data that are observed that might have a lower quality. And so uh, the training model or the uh, part of the training process is to account for the uncertainty in the data that you're using to train the, the models and how that will affect the model down the road. Uh, and of course, uh, what we wanna do is long-term goal is to really use our work to help save lives like a lot of the audience here and so uh, we do want to uh, transition a lot of our research work to operational use as soon as possible. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Alex, great presentation. Um, I'm gonna take back controls in case I need to promote anybody to presenter. We've had quite a few um, questions come in, so I think we should go ahead and get started since we have 12 minutes left. Um, Greg, the first question is for you. Um, regarding validation methodology, was a correct forecast with just one observed RIP counted the same as when multiple RIPs were observed? Yes, yeah, good question. So so the way it, the way we work is is really it's just yes or no. Are there hazardous RIP currents or not? Um, and, and we don't take into account, you know, numbers of rips or strength of rips, um, not directly anyway, uh, other than to say, you know, if we get a yes and there's additional information that says, hey, we, we saw a whole bunch of rips or we think they were very strong today, then we have greater confidence in that observation. Uh, but the model itself uh, just is looking at yes, no. Are there hazardous rip currents at this particular beach or or not? Um, there's a possibility that we try to do something greater than that down the road in terms of intensity or, you know, it, trying to account for potential, you know, not not all hazardous rips are created equally. Um, but for now, that that's not the case. Great, thanks. And then another question for you, Greg. What constitutes a busy rip current day? say in terms of rips per 10 kilometers, recognizing this is a function of the coast we're talking about? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I think that's gonna be very location dependent. Um, you know, and, and it, you know, in some places we know, and you can see it in the imagery, 
and where you have a rip current every couple hundred meters along the beach over and over and over again you kind of get these repeated rips and usually there is you know if you're talking about open coast bathymetry driven rips you usually do have some kind of regular structure to where we see them along the beach if it's if it's on the open coast um and and you know in those cases if you know on the east coast for instance where they're going to be tidally dependent you'll have you know so you might have a rip every few hundred meters and that at low tide will be pulling you know for three four five hours and then you get up to you know higher tides and then it decreases intensity and maybe stops altogether um, and so it's really kind of a function of 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 when the tide is relative to people being at the beach um, and then you know as i mentioned kind of those regular rip you know based rips uh along the beach that are going to impact uh safety from a, from an occurrence standpoint and then of course you have things like structural rips and transient rips which you know structural rips is easy because you have a structure transient rips we know much less about in terms of exactly how often they occur um and where they occur that's there's still a lot of science to be done there Great, thanks, Greg. And then um, Alex, we have a question for you from Chris Brewster. The various models appear to involve elevated views, either overhead or from a high point. How high must the observations be to be effective and are these elevations easily available at beaches? Uh, good question. Uh, so most of our training data are from high elevations and they do perform better with higher elevations. Uh, we have tried it on some of the test data, as, uh, for example, the video where at the lower elevation, they were not like directly overhead as uh, one might see, one might get from a drone video, for example, uh, but they, they still do uh, pretty well. Uh, we have tried it on ground or beach level videos. Um, unfortunately, we don't have um, data where we have obvious rips to um to 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 say you know positively whether uh it you know how much it degrades the performance of the model for um uh depending on the height so we are trying to find uh there's actually a place uh near santa cruz where there's a elevated view and there's a stairs towards the beach and we're trying to collect data uh at different heights as we walk down the stairs uh, but unfortunately, that place does not have a consistent rip where we could do the testing. So we are uh, watching it and uh, comparing it uh, or, or looking at Greg's uh, forecast models for when we should go out and collect more data. So uh, I'll hope, hopefully get an answer uh, to you uh, sometime soon. Great. Thanks, Alex. And then... Um... I think this might be for Greg, um, but Alex chime in if I'm wrong. So from Al, some breaks in the sandbars are semi-permanent. For example, my favorite surf break has had a rip for as long as I remember. How do you keep up with the transient breaks for the models? So with, uh, so the ML model doesn't care. Uh, actually, both of them don't care, right? Uh, so the flow-based model, we simply look at the video clip and look at the uh, flow information. And it doesn't matter whether it's a, a permanent rip or a transient rip. Um, and with the ML model, currently, uh, if you have a situation, uh, I'm not sure, if, Greg, if this is phys physically possible, but let's say in the morning, the rip is in this area, uh, that the, like the channel is in this area. In the afternoon, the channel moved to some, some other location along the beach. Uh, with the ML model, it doesn't matter either because it will simply look at the appearance of the wave. So depending on uh, the video or the image that, the, that you feed the ML model, it would say, yeah, there's a rip or not. So it's, it's really independent of whether it's a transient rip or a permanent rip yeah and i'll add if it, since it's not clear if, if he's asking about the 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 rip current model or the the machine learning model we have two different types of models so <laughs> so for the rip model if if that was of interest we don't get down to that resolution so you know we're looking at kilometer scale variability 
Um, and so not capturing specific rips or specific changes in the bar. Um, and so it's much more focused on general conditions for that section of coastline. Uh, you know, it, it, so from so from this standpoint, like the work that Alex is doing from being able to detect rips using imagery in a much more precise way will help enable us potentially to get to higher resolutions in more specific types of you know rip situations, especially near structures and 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 like that, uh, like those kind of cases in the future. So so I think this is one of those things where we didn't we didn't have observations to be able to really get to to high res. Uh, you know, rip current detection, and now we're starting to get there. And so, so I think that will really help move us forward in that way in the future. Great, thanks. And he did clarify for the rip model. So thank you guys for both answering. And then, um, Greg, another question from David. Are there any spatial temporal patterns associated with rip currents in the U.S. coasts? If so, do you expect a significant change of such patterns due to increasing sea levels? So that's a good question. I don't, you know, that, so that is an interesting thing. So are there certain locations where we see rips more often? How does that vary seasonally maybe? Um, and things like that. Um, and then are there potentially climate impacts that could affect how rips are occurring? Or, you know, and beyond, I'll add to that, also changes in the bathymetry like nourishment um, and erosion and what kind of impacts do that does that have potentially as well? And so that's a really great question. We have no idea, um, <laughs> is the, the, the simple answer is we just don't have the data to look at that variability along the coast and in time. I think we would like to. Um, I think camera imagery has a potential, maybe satellite imagery or aerial imagery has a potential to get us there. Um, but for now, it, it, we just don't have the observations to be able to say one way or the other. I think the one thing I would just add is, you know, there's some evidence saying that wave heights might increase uh due to climate change uh in the future and so if that is true certainly that could potentially lead towards uh generally higher rates of rip currents um but uh but beyond that we just you know it, it's very speculative and we, we just don't know that's something we'd like to answer great thank you and um alex this is a question for you and it's from um Keytron. why do you use a segmentation model instead uh, yeah, so there are other uh, methods that use uh, uh, color segmentation. And for the flow-based approach, uh, the color segmentation, uh, so, so the segmentation part usually divides the image into different portions such as the beach, uh, the surf zone, open water, and so on. Uh, for the flow-based approach, it basically looks at flow information. So we don't really need the segmentation portion uh, step. Uh, for the machine learning part, I don't think or I don't see how segmentation would help off the top. Uh, it's possible that there might be situations where segmentations might come in handy to, 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 to black out certain portions of the image from being considered, uh, but off the top, um, uh, I don't see how, how segmentations would help. But there are other methods that do use segmentation, so kind of more uh, image processing approach. Great, thanks. And wow, we're getting so many questions coming in. I don't know if we'll get to them all in time. Um, if we don't get to your question today, what I'll do is I'll email both Greg and Alex and give them an opportunity to answer the questions and then I'll send you guys an email with the answers. Um, one question we're getting is a lot about um, maps of rip currents. Like if we have a, if we know what the surf zone is prior to an event, can you provide a map of where rip currents are likely to appear? or there are their preferred sections of the beach for rip currents. Um, so I think, Greg, that might be a question for you. And then also, is there a seasonality in occurrence of rip currents? Yeah, so, so those are both good questions. So, so in terms of, of, of kind of maps, I think that gets into, you know, imagery can help with that too, potentially. Um, and it gets into some work that folks at uh, 
in particular at USGS, Army Corps, um, Oregon State, uh, Rob Holman's group have done using what's called CBATHY, which is basically taking video data and looking at how waves approach the coastline and based off of, you know, known wave relationships in shallow water, you can derive bathymetry from that video and from how waves are progressing over the bottom. Um, and that can effectively give you a map of the bathymetry uh, updated regularly, which could then tell you where you're likely to see rips from a, from a bathy standpoint. Um, it's still very much a research effort uh, and it requires video beyond what we could typically get in a webcam because you need to have it uh, basically, you know, uh, need to have it uh, calibrated, the, your, your op optics calibrated properly and, and, and no kind of ele set elevation so you can, you know, rectify the imagery. Um, and so it's something we've talked about doing uh, to be able to get to that, but it's, it's still a ways off. Um, I, I think that has the potential to get to your question of, of you know, creating a map, a bathy map, and then kind of understanding that. But I think that's still a few years away. Um, and then the seasonal question, yes, definitely, because rips are dependent on both wave energy and bathymetry, the shape of the bottom, and those both vary seasonally. So there's definitely seasonal variability. Um, I, I would say that, you know, that's something that we've noticed in particular with modeling on the, the, the West Coast in San Diego, where we have a different model fit in the summer and in the winter months that we want to apply. And so we're working at looking at that as part of our model uh, output, it's something we haven't worried about in the East Coast, because from a safety standpoint, we're really only worried, at least in the, the middle of the East Coast, really only worried about the summer months. Uh, or, and so in Florida and then in California, the, the seasonal effect becomes more important. And so definitely something we're looking at as well. Yeah, I can confirm with Greg that uh, at least in Santa Cruz area, uh, winter months uh, where we have larger waves, there's definitely way more uh, rip currents. Stronger awesome. too. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Greg and Alex. Um, so we didn't get to five questions, so I'm going to shoot you guys an email with these questions and I'll send the answers to the folks who asked them. And we're getting a lot of kudos um, and thank you for the presentation. And I want to thank you guys for spending your lunch hour with us. Um, we're going to share a recording of the webinar with everyone who's registered. And as I said before, if we didn't get to your question, we'll get them answered. All right. So you guys enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you, guys.